We're super thrilled that this very episode is included on the podcast Brunch Club listening list in July. PBC is a community of engaged podcast listeners who get together in person once a month to discuss a thematic set of podcast episodes. July's theme is conspiracy, and in addition to this episode, there will be four more that cover the theme. I encourage you to join PBC where you live so you can discuss the topic of conspiracy theories and future hindsight in real life. Finding community in this way is a perfect alignment of civil discourse and civic engagement. Go to podcastbrunchclub.com to find your local chapter. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Nancy Rosenblum. She's a Senator Joseph S. Clark Professor of Ethics in Politics and Government at Harvard University and co-author of A Lot of People Are Saying, The New Conspiracism and the Assault on Democracy. This episode examines the purpose of the most outrageous conspiracy claims running rampant in our public discourse and why it is so deeply dangerous to our society and democracy. We have something new today, which my co-author and I call conspiracism. And it's conspiracy without the theory. That is, it says, the election is rigged. No evidence that the election is rigged, no evidence of fraudulent voters. There's no evidence and there's no argument. It's a sheer, bold assertion of a conspiracy claim. So we have something really quite extraordinary, which is the assertion of the way things really are, that they're not as you think they are, but without reasoning in the way that we know how to reason. We talk about how conspiracism disorients our populace, delegitimates our democratic institutions and even our party system, and finally, that mainstreaming conspiracism has made it possible for the president to impose his reality on all of us. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So your book is fascinating. I really enjoyed it. And it's so well researched. And it really, really made me think very deeply about what's happening with discourse in the public sphere. You write about the new conspiracism, which is conspiracy. Conspiracy theory without theory. So <laughs> let's start with the basics. What is conspiracy theory in the classic sense? Conspiracy theory is a notion that things are not as they seem and that you have to uncover the hidden paths of power. Conspiracy theory is as old as politics. And I should say at the outset that conspiracy theories are often true. <laughs> in fact, conspiracy theories can serve democracy. If we think back to the progressive era where they looked at what was going on with elites in smoke-filled rooms or in corporate boardrooms and monopolies and so on, and they uncovered the secret paths of power and they democratized American politics. So that's sort of good conspiracy theory. And I think the important thing about classic conspiracy theory is that it argues in recognizable ways. That is, it says that something's happening not as it seems, and it produces all kinds of evidence and arguments for why that's the case. So conspiracy theory is accessible in the sense that it reasons the way we think reasoning works. We have something new today, which my co-author and I call conspiracism, and it's conspiracy without the theory. That is, it says the election is rigged. No evidence that the election is rigged, no evidence of fraudulent voters. There's no evidence and there's no argument. It's a sheer, bold assertion of a conspiracy claim that uh, scientists are doing hoax science, that the, national, the intelligence agencies, they're making up facts. So we have something really quite extraordinary, which is the assertion of the way things really are, that they're not as you think they are, but without reasoning in the way that we know how to reason. President Trump, in particular, lies. He tells lies for the same reason we all tell lies. That is, we want some advantage, and we want you to believe that what we're saying is true. I think the Washington Post said their statistic was over 16,000 lies in his first three years or something like that. These lies and these falsehoods, they come and go. They're like ephemera in the wind. They're replaced by other lies, whereas his conspiracy claims have a very long half-life. 
So they're repeated over and over, and we don't forget them, that he didn't really lose the popular vote. It was a rigged election. Again, no evidence, but a consistent argument about certain things. The deep state is another argument, right? Or the media being enemies of the people. Because this claim about fake news is a conspiracy claim. It's saying that reporters and editors and publishers, right, are engaged in a coordinated exercise to misinform the people. So his conspiracism is consistent and insistent, and it has a particular kind of dangerousness and effect that conspiracy theory as a general matter doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's go with that, because since his conspiracism is consistent and repeated, and we won't forget, you argue in your book that conspiracism basically disorients and delegitimizes. So let's go with disorientation first. How does it work? Well, I, I wrote this book because I was startled into thought, right? And I fastened on the conspiracism that had been beyond imagination. And it started on day two of his presidency when he claimed that his inaugural crowd was the largest ever. And when the next day the National Park Service published the photographs, which showed it to be a modest crowd compared to others, he said that the National Park Service civilian photographers had doctored the photographs. And I thought to myself, this is extraordinary. It sort of stopped me in my tracks. And that's what I mean about disorientation. It's an assault on common sense. There's no really way of refuting it. The reasons why people go along with it are not reasons that you can really argue with. It's disorienting, too, because we begin to see that something's going on behind it that's really terribly anti-democratic and that makes politics impossible. So since we're talking about disorientation, you talk in the book about imposing reality and who owns reality. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. It's linked in some ways to our notion of common sense. And most of us have some sort of grasp on what we think is going on around us and what we call reality in a basic facticity way. You know, my name is Nancy Rosenblum. I'm a professor at Harvard, and that's reality. And what Donald Trump does is he has, quite naturally, I think, not as a result of the presidency, a compromised sense of reality. When he's confronted with something in the world that doesn't suit him or feed his what are probably quite deep needs, but I'm not a psychiatrist, he concocts a reality that he likes, that makes sense. And the lying is part of it, but the conspiracism is a better way of getting it because you really see how he develops a narrative in response to the fact that Hillary Clinton did beat him out by three million votes, and he had to concoct a reality that she didn't, mm -hmm. she didn't, that he really won. So that's the creation of a compromised sense of reality. And when you're president, you can impose it on the nation. And that's really a striking thing to see. The only experiences people know about, really, that are like that is when you have a cult and a cult leader. And the cult leader imposes a reality on your understanding of the world and, in fact, on how you live. Now, there's no physical cult here, but this notion of having a prophetic sense of what reality is and imposing it on people is what's happening. And we've never seen anything like it before. It's very, very disorienting. So it's disorienting personally, but it's also exceptionally disorienting when you realize that Everyone else is having this experience, too. It's kind of collective disorientation. One of the things that I encounter all the time, and you talk about this also in the book, is that when you are with people that you don't know and you're having a dinner party or something like this and you meet people that you don't know or a cocktail party and uh, you try and figure out whether they inhabit the same space, whether you share the reality. And it used to be totally irrelevant in many ways, whether the person you're talking to is conservative or progressive. But now it's something else because they believe something so different. So I was recently in Texas and I was talking to somebody about the election. And he said, well, I hear that Soros spends a lot of money on this campaign. And I said, well, that's not true. And he goes, but that's what I hear. And there's nothing to say back to that. And I really didn't know what to say, so I just kind of said nothing and changed the subject. 
What would be a better response? I don't think there is one. I think what's dividing people in this case is not political opinions per se. I think what's dividing people here is something very, very deep, what philosophers would call epistemic things. That is, how you know what you know. What does it mean to know something? And for most people, and even for conspiracy theorists, what it means to know something is that you have evidence and you have arguments, again, sometimes warranted, sometimes not, that you're open to new evidence, that it can be corrected. If you ask, how do you know that George Soros is financing the migration across the southern border, he is likely to say, well, a lot of people say so, or I just know it. He's not going to give you evidence. It's a claim. And so this gets to the argument that we make about why conspiracism has force. One is, it's very, very simple. Climate change is a hoax. It can be done in 28 characters in Twitter. It doesn't require argument. Even conspiracy theories are convoluted and you have to learn something. But that's not the case when you say it's just a hoax. Second of all, you can always deny responsibility in the sense that we see this all the time. A lot of people are saying that. I'm just asking questions. If you remember Attorney General Barr's testimony before Congress, he was asked about the wiretapping of uh, members of Trump's campaign. And he got out there and he said, I think spying did occur. So he used the charge word spying. It's very serious. This is important. So that's the sheer assertion part of it. Spying did occur. And then he switched to just asking questions because he had no evidence of it. So he could disavow what he had just done. Part of its appeal is the form that it takes, the sheer assertion and just asking questions. The other is, I think, that when people subscribe to this, when they echo it, I don't think they're really saying that all of the particulars are true. Because you say, how can people believe this? Well, I don't think belief is the right way of thinking about it at all. I think that what's going on here is that a particular conspiracist claim is tapping into the anxieties or fears or hatreds. And when they like and retweet and so on, they are identifying themselves with a certain set of political attitudes and people. It's almost a form of political participation. And I think so people are buoyed and their fears and anxieties and hatreds are underscored by this company of people that tweet and retweet these conspiracy theories. So, for example, Pizzagate. Hillary Clinton was running a child sex trafficking ring out of Comet Ping Pong in northwest Washington. So, do these followers of Pizzagate believe this? I, I don't think they believe it. What they believe is that Hillary Clinton is a demon, that she's an enemy, and that this kind of story about her is true enough. And that's the phrase that we use to explain what people are ascribing to or assenting to. It's true enough. For example, Trump re-sent out a fake video that showed a Muslim migrant attacking someone. And the press very quickly discovered that it was a doctored thing and not a real video. And they asked Sarah Huckabee Sanders about this. And she said, well... Even if it isn't real video, the threat is real. It was true enough because it got at the situation that people were fearful of and wanted general recognition for. And then one last thing about the uh, power of this kind of conspiracism is that it's a kind of act of aggression to do it. It's what we call performative aggression. And the more disturbing it is, the more disorienting it is, the more shocking it is, the more gratifying it is to spread this kind of conspiracy claim. There's a kind of emotional release to conspiracism that ordinary rhythms of democratic politics don't have. Well, I think this is the perfect segue then to delegitimation because one of the things that disorientation or this performative aggression does is it makes you feel like you're participating in politics. And one of the arguments you make in the book, and really it made me think very differently about Republicans, <laughs> frankly, that you have two sort of loyal opponents and that this is part of 
having public discourse where you break apart, you have tension, you have dialogue, and then you come back together after the election and you figure out a way to work together and serve the public. But this is totally lacking. And in fact, political parties are being attacked through this and are delegitimized. Can you talk more about that? I think the lasting problem of conspiracism today and the way it's shaping public life is that its effect is that it delegitimizes our basic democratic institutions. When you delegitimate an institution, it means that you're saying it no longer has meaning or value or authority for you. And so you don't have to consent to it and you don't have to be compliant. And let's start with mainstream media, right? Fake news. A large part of our population no longer thinks that what we think of as reliable media have any meaning, value, or authority for them. It goes to the whole gamut of knowledge-producing institutions, right? The assaults on the intelligence agencies so that the reports of the national security director have no meaning, no value, and no authority for us. But you bring up the political party part of it, which is the second leg of democracy that's being delegitimated. And I think that if you had to name one institution that was the defining institution of representative democracy, it would be a party system in which you have multiple parties and which you have a notion of a loyal opposition and that the opposition has a role in government. So this notion of a loyal opposition in a party system is as old as modern democracy and You can't have a functioning democracy without it. And what we've watched for some time is the very intense polarization of the parties. This is not new. Trump did not invent this. In fact, I think it permitted Trump (laughs) to come into power. But the result of it, once he's been in office, has been a real escalation of this. What I mean is that it starts with the Republicans saying that Democratic leaders and candidates are illegitimate candidates. It started with birtherism, that Obama was not a legitimate president and he wasn't born in this country. Or Hillary Clinton was not a legitimate candidate because she was a criminal. That's the chant, lock her up, lock her up, right? And then it extends to the entire opposition party. The notion that it's not just a contrary view of the public interest, but that it's treasonous. It started with his first State of the Union address, where the Democrats didn't clap very much. And he went to the press and he said, uh, can you call them traitors? Well, I don't know. It could be. They could be traitors. And it started with that. And then we have a succession of dozens of claims that the Democratic Party is treasonous. Republicans in recent years have done things that uh, really are outside the norm for democracies, like disenfranchising voters, The notion that you're disenfranchising them because there's real danger of treason if they're in office facilitates and justifies for many people the most radical kinds of anti-democratic measures. And you can't have a democracy that survives without acknowledging a loyal opposition, and that's what's visibly happening before our eyes. And it leads to violence. Many people know about the El Paso massacre, and he published a screed online. And what's been quoted from that screed, and what's certainly important, given that who he murdered, was the Trumpian line on immigration, that we're being overtaken by immigrants who are A, criminal, and B, diluting the white race. But most of the screed, if you read it, is against Democrats, and against the Democratic Party as being the party of treason, and it's the party that's trying to overturn us from within. Delegitimation of the opposition is a justification for a massacre. National survival depends upon doing away with the opposition. This is not new in history, but it's pretty new here. Right. Well, one of the things that you said in your book also is that this conspiracism in the end will undo the Republican Party. What do you mean by that? How is that going to work? Because right now they're in tandem and they're in a way inseparable Conservatives in the Republican Party have always been against elements of the state, especially the administrative state, the regulatory state. They want to unleash private power and private business. And that's one of the Republican orthodoxies. 
it's been hard for them to do that because people really do want some health care and they want some clean water. And, you know, it's it becomes easier to make those arguments if you claim that these administrative agencies are populated by a deep state, that what's going on here are not well-meaning civil servants who follow the rules and follow the administration, but potentially treasonous people. So that's the alliance between them. And I think the Republicans have accepted the help of conspiracism in what's Republican orthodoxy. The trouble is that there's nothing in conspiracism per se that's Republican. It's destructive, it's delegitimating, it's disorienting, but it has itself no program, no policy, no ideology. In fact, I think it's fair to say that in the United States, conspiracism has replaced ideology as the major tool in politics. Conspiracism is really politically very effective. You can do things that you couldn't have done by just making arguments and persuading people on rational grounds and so on. It's entirely possible that conspiracism will migrate across the political spectrum. That's the fear that we will have more and more of this overtaking political life. People used to talk about the end of ideology, that everyone was going to become a liberal Democrat. We may be having the end of ideology and everybody's becoming a conspiracist. Okay, if that's true, (laughs) what is the world going to look like then? (laughs) I'm certainly not hopeless about this. And I do believe when Trump is out, conspiracism is likely to return to the fringes. It won't be that there's no politician who subscribes to this or uses it as a weapon. But I think this particular malignant thing will recede because I think it's being perpetrated by a genuine conspiracist mindset in Trump and by his hold on an entire political party that allows him to use it. Okay, that's fair. So you have two prescriptions to start combating because this is going to be a long-term project. You say the first thing we need to do is speak the truth, and the second thing is to enact democracy. Let's go with speaking truth first. What uh, can we do there? Because if they have this different sense of reality, it only goes so far, but we still need to do it. And so why is that? Well, I think the speaking truth to conspiracism is important. I don't think you will ever persuade a conspiracist or a true Trumpian follower to change views. So you're not speaking truth to them in the hope of changing their minds. What you're trying to do is to reinforce the common sense of those people who are disoriented by it and to show that there's a kind of solidarity behind the old style, ordinary reasoning about politics and to immunize some people who aren't paying attention or might be inclined not to do it. So besides which, it's morally required. So I think speaking truth is important, and I think we saw it in the impeachment trial with Adam Schiff, who was so clear and spoke truth so calmly in a way and deliberately. It didn't cure our national reality disorder, but I think it was a very healthy thing for our democracy, for that to have happened. In the case of Adam Schiff during the impeachment trial is also at the same time an example of enacting democracy. Yeah, so what does that mean to enact democracy? It's to follow regular procedures and to take on, in a serious way, the responsibilities of the office, whatever office it is, but not just to do it, to say that you're doing it and to explain why you're doing it. That is to make acts of government legible and in a way pedagogical. I think this trial did do that. It was in the nature of a trial to do that because you're producing the evidence and so on. There are other good examples. When Trump kept insisting that there were so many fraudulent voters and elections were rigged, he created this Election Integrity Commission headed by this guy, Kopak. They began to ask the governors and secretaries of the state to provide all kinds of information about voters and so on. Many, many of the Democratic governors and secretaries of state refused to give in the data. They ended up having to disband this Election Integrity Commission. But they didn't just quietly do it. We might never have known that they were not going to submit this information, except that they announced it. They publicly said, I'm not going to do it. We have no evidence of voter fraud in our state. We've examined this. We're not going to go along with the show trial of the election fraud. That was my answer when I wrote the book. 
I think now I have a simpler answer. Oh yeah, what's that? You have to vote. <laughs> <laughs> you, have to, you have to you have to vote these people out and you you don't have to vote out conservatism, even the most radical conservatism. You have to vote out people who go along first of all with saying that the opposition is it not a loyal opposition. The one party represents true Americans and the other party is treasonous and people who press these conspiracist claims. I think anybody who went along with Trump's claim that Ukraine, not Russia, interfered with the 2016 election should be voted out of office because we need reality, not a compromised sense of reality, to have any kind of functioning democracy. Yes, agreed. On that note, last question, looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Oh, a lot of things make me hopeful. We don't know much about how stable democracies are destabilized and delegitimated. And we really know almost nothing about how to relegitimate democratic institutions. But I do believe we have the resources for that. And I think that we have resources in basic respect for law and order. I think we have a terrific bar association. I think the legal side of it has been and will be important and is hopeful. I think that the great resource of Americans in democracy is not only voting, the formal participation, but a very, very rich resource of civil society, more than almost any other country in the world. We have religious groups and advocacy groups, and these people are not necessarily in politics, but they know how to be involved in politics. That is to say, they know what is required to keep a civil society civil. And I think that that goes very deep and is finally, in the long run, more even than our Constitution, which we can see is, is the social organization of Americans. Excellent. Thank you for your time and thank you for your scholarship. Thank you for having me. I didn't used to think very much about the fact that other people might inhabit a different reality than I do. After all, our experiences are subjective, but hard facts on the ground are indisputable and our democracy can only function in the realm of reality. We taped this interview earlier this year, well before COVID and unrest in the streets. In Nancy's words about the power of conspiracism to be destructive and leading to violence, now feel like an urgent warning that we managed to ignore. Our national reality disorder is truly destroying us. Speaking the truth over and over is an act of relegitimating one of the core pillars of American democracy, our freedom of speech. We're also enacting democracy when we continue to value reasoning and common sense and a world based in facts. Stand up for truth. It matters. Next week, our guest is John Greenberg. He's a senior correspondent with PolitiFact and was part of the PolitiFact team during the 2012 presidential election. He was also executive editor at New Hampshire Public Radio and a Washington reporter for NPR. There is a hunger for what we're doing. I would say that one of the benefits is simply that we exist. And by virtue of our website and by virtue of the stories we do and the fact checks we do, we become a gathering point for people who share a fundamental value. Facts do matter. There is an objective reality out there. We can look at it. We can see that it is not a function purely of spin, and we can make decisions based on that. Because we do what we do, people who share that value have a place to come to and see that they are not alone. We talk about the true value of fact-checking in journalism, the importance of using neutral language in reporting when presenting facts, and the resistance to believing facts in the face of personal political ideology. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service.
This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.